Thank you. Thank you very much. And welcome. I'm Father Mitch Packwell. Welcome to Scripture and Tradition, where that's what we study, Scripture and Tradition. Uh, just like St. Paul said, hold on to the traditions that I left you, whether by word or by letter. So we look at both. And we are continuing our study on the, the influences on us. We had talked a, a few weeks ago, about so, five, six weeks ago, about the role of uh, the Spirit of God and the flesh. And then we talked about the world and its impact on us. And now we've started talking last week about the last of the influences, namely the devil. And we, so those are the four influences. God's Holy Spirit works within us, but we also have to deal with our own selves and our selfish desires, etc. And we have to deal with the world around us and its attempts to influence us and sway us, and then the devil's influences, uh, which can work in any of the uh, previous two. <laughs> the devil can certainly work with the world or with our own egos. So how do we recognize his role? And we've been talking about Saint, how the devil rules the world, you know, in, in the sense of that, that opposition and corruption that is opposed to God. But uh, we also, even though God created the universe, the cosmos, we see that he has a great influence on the world, um, especially through power, selfishness, riches, a lot, a lot of things he can use and manipulate. But now we want to deal with St. Paul's teaching about Satan. And one of the best places to find it, because he doesn't mention the devil very often. If anybody mentions the devil a lot, it's Jesus Christ himself. He mentions it way more than anybody else, just like our Lord Jesus mentions hell lots of times. But St. Paul never does. You know, it's not in Paul. But, but uh, our Lord mentions it a lot. But in the past, one of the passages where St. Paul especially deals with the evil is in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Now here's the deal. He is writing to the Corinthians because there are some others who have come into the community that he started. He started that community in 51 AD, preaching there and establishing the church. And some others came in and they began calling themselves super apostles. Paul was an apostle, but they were super apostles. And the word they use is hyper or hyper apostles. You know, we get the word hyper from that. So, this is uh, one of the uh, things that he's dealing with. And he also calls them false apostles. He says, for such men are false apostles, deceitful working workmen, disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. Now, this is a very important passage for us to understand, especially when we're trying to deal with discernment of what's from God and what's from Satan. He, this, he gives a very important warning about the ability of the forces of evil, their power, their cleverness, and they can transform themselves into something that looks good. This is typical. This is what we should expect. Do you think that evil and the evil one tries to present sin with its full impact of evil and showing how disgusting and destructive evil is? Of course not. Remember back at the beginning of this whole study when we began going through my book 
on uh, the, the, this is the one winning the battle against sin. We talked about how the serpent tempted the woman. Did he say, come on, I want you to commit a big sin and then go to hell? Is that what he said? No, no. Did God really tell you not to eat any of the fruit? Oh, no, we can eat everything except the tree of knowledge of good and evil in the middle of the garden. They said, well, God just doesn't want you to know what he knows. You see how he portrays it? God is trying to jealously guard his prerogatives of knowledge from you. And then, uh, furthermore, it looks good to taste, good to eat, it's pretty, and it's desirous for the knowledge it'll give you. See how he portrayed it as something, and also he, he took away the uh, threat of punishment. Oh, you won't die. You'll just learn as much as God knows. Don't you want to learn what? You'll become like God. Your eyes will be open. You see how he portrays this as something good. Why? Because we truly, at the core of our being, want what is good. That's the way we're made to want good. The problem is sometimes we substitute those things that lack enough good. They don't have enough of goodness in them. That's where the problem is. There's, alcohol is good, but drinking too much makes you drunk, and that is bad. It, it's, it's not that there's, you know, alcohol seems to help the human uh, 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 person and your health in certain amounts. But some people can't even do a small amount because they become addicted right away. So this is something that we see. The devil does not want us to see the full impact of the evil of what happens when you get drunk. He said he wants you to be one of the cool guys who goes out and drinks. That's the attraction. Yeah, he doesn't want you to see what you'll look like when you're 70 after you've been smoking a whole life. He says, no, you've got to be with the cool kids. They smoke. And besides, smoking helps you curb your appetite so you won't put on so much weight. That's why a lot of girls start smoking, teenage girls. And so, oh, yeah, I don't want to put weight. So, so he won't present the full impact of how your voice sounds like a truck driver's by the time you're 55. He just tells you, you know, uh, this would be, it'd be cool. This is typical of that kind of temptation. And each one of us should fully expect that sin will be portrayed to us during temptations as innocent pleasures. Well, look, I mean, everybody does this. Everybody eats too much. Everybody gets a little drunk sometimes. And, you know, sex is so much fun. I, yeah, God doesn't want you to be deprived of that fun, does he? How many times do you hear that kind of false argument? Well. This is something that uh, we should keep in mind. If somebody wants to feed you poison, they're not going to give you a bottle with a skull and crossbones on it and say, oh, drink this. <laughs> they're not going to do that. They're going to put it in your ice cream on top of a piece of cake or mix it in the chocolate syrup with the ice cream and cake and tell you, oh, don't worry about your diet. This is good for you. That's what the devil does with his tempting of all of us. Just apply it to the other things of life besides ice cream and cake, and you've got it down pat. Now, these false apostles they, who called themselves hyper-apostles or super-apostles, um, this is something that is also a grave sin because these are people who are pseudo-Christians, that present heretical teachings. Now, what does heresy mean? Heresy comes from a Greek word that means taking apart, out of the context of the whole. So, you know, you, you, people do this all the time. They'll give you partial truths 
and keep it out of the context of the whole. And that applies to so many areas of life. Kids will, will say all kinds of things. Uh, did you eat the ice cream? It's smeared all over. No, I don't know who did. <laughs> they were there because it's still on them. So that's, thanks be to God, kids aren't that bright. So it's easy to catch them. But sometimes other people are a little more smart. And when it comes to false apostles, they will take true statements about God and about the church, about salvation, about anything, out of the context of the whole mystery of salvation. Salvation, and well, first of all, God is infinite, and as such is mysterious to us. The universe is finite. There's a limit to the universe. And Einstein showed that, and also Max Planck with the uh, you know, speed of light shows that light goes at a certain speed, and there's also a limit to the universe. It's an expanding universe, but there's a limit. And that, that's because the universe is finite. It's not eternal. It had a big bang to begin it, and it's in limited space. God is infinite. There's no limit to him. And so, as difficult as it is to understand the universe and science and the mysteries of science, how much more the mysteries of God? And that's why it's easy to take some of the parts out of the context. That's why people thought at one point, they thought, that the world is flat. Now, sailors didn't fall for that. You know why? They could see ships coming on the horizon of the sea. And they could see that the top of the sails and then the t more the, the masts and then the whole ship. And so they knew that there was a curvature. And the Greek, ancient Greeks knew that it was curved because they could see the shadow of the earth on the moon during lunar eclipses, uh, which is remarkable. But some people thought it was flat because they only see part. They see a plane. People live in the, who don't look up enough at the sky and people who don't pay attention to phenomena and people who just see the flat, say, well, it's just a flat earth. But once you get a bigger picture, then you realize it's round. That's fine. And so this is where we need to have all kinds of the, the whole of what God reveals about himself and not take parts out of the context. Jehovah's Witnesses are a good example. They uh, take all kinds of scriptures out of context. And then they come up with this theory that Jesus Christ is the Archangel Michael. They don't tell you that when they first come to your door. They don't say that. They first of all try to get you to deny that Jesus is God the Son by mistranslating John chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God. And they, trans mis me, they mistranslated as, and the Word was a God. That's bad Greek. They don't realize what a predicate, nominative, and arthritis sentence is. <laughs> That's technical, but it's... The way that it doesn't mean that the word was a God. It's just that the word is the subject and the object is uh, predicate uh, nominative uh, uh, is, is God. So the word was God, not a God. So that's just they don't, just don't know Greek grammar, bless their hearts. But then they trick people and they don't tell you what they wrote in one of their articles in Awake magazine years ago that that mistranslation was given to them by an ex-priest named Gruber, who got it from his wife, who got it from channeling a spirit. She, was, she did a seance, and the spirit told it to mistranslate it. They don't tell you all that. And you can see how they go door to door giving you this false information, and you don't know, that, you know where it all comes from. And they try to trick people into denying that Jesus is God the Son. And so this is where we have to be very, very alert. Because what they do is they make the mysteries of God so rational and so simple. Jehovah's Witnesses are not an emotional group at all. They're very rational. But the problem is they limit God to what their mind can comprehend. In fact, the, the man who started the Jehovah's Witnesses 
did so because when he was 16, he used to get into debates in Pittsburgh with people on the street corners. You know, they used to do that in the old days. And he could prove the existence of God, no problem. But he could not prove the divinity of Jesus Christ. And if he can't prove it, no one can. Now, see, it's not only that he tries to reduce it to his logic. It's also the same kind of arrogance of Satan. If I can't prove it, nobody can. If I can't understand it, nobody can understand it. That's not the way life is, Bubba. You may not prove it, but go to your betters and see if they can. He just didn't realize that there were so many people that were better thinkers than he. And what you see is that when you accept, accept heretical teaching at the expense of some element or some aspect of the mystery of God and his revelation, you find that instead of the truth of God that comes from Jesus Christ that sets us free, it becomes a falsehood that binds us. And that is always going to be the case, not only with false teachings about Christ, like Jehovah's Witnesses and others too, but in so many other areas too. They are giving you part of the truth and some falsehood mixed in it, like false apostles do, so that you can be enslaved to them and their way of thought. And you see that, uh, for instance, the longer Jehovah Witnesses existed, the more they came up with things like no blood transfusion. They didn't, they weren't against blood transfusions in the beginning, but they did it when somebody botched something and so they became against all blood transfusions. They weren't against Christmas. They, there's a photograph of them celebrating Christmas at their headquarters with the leaders back in the er early 1900s. Then they turned against it. And so many other things, too, birthday parties, same thing. They, they, this was all stuff that increasingly enslaved for rules that have nothing to do with what God revealed. Now, we also have to keep in mind that there are a lot of other false teachings besides just heresies. A lot of modern people come up with false teachings. They do a variety of um, uh, techniques, for instance, when it comes to even within groups that are fully Christian, you know, among many Catholics and Orthodox and many other uh, uh, the Protestant communities, you'll have people teaching falsehoods of different kinds. And what they'll do is they'll try to per uh, portray, say, the Apostles' Creed or the Nicene Creed. It's kind of backwards. I was at a, uh, I got kicked out of saying mass at one place because I wouldn't stop calling God Father when the prayers and the readings of Scripture said so. Got kicked out of another place because I said the, the Nicene Creed when it was required and they didn't like the Creed anymore. And it's just sort of backwards and uh, oppressive. That's what they would say. And they especially like to use it to deny various moral teachings. Well, the church is out of date. It, I mean, the Pope is, and, and all those bishops and cardinals, they're just celibate males. They don't know what it's like. They don't understand. You hear that argument? That argument was also used in the uh, 1500s and later, excuse me, the 15th century and later, when various Catholics began to engage in the slave trade, even though the Pope had put it under the uh, automatic excommunication. And their argument was, well, the Pope doesn't know what it's like to run a plantation in the Americas. We have to get slaves to do this. He's out, he's out of touch with reality. We know how plantations work. We can't make any money unless we have slaves. So the, let the Pope talk all he wants. We'll just make slaves. Do you think that that's different from what they do on other areas of life as well? The same kind of reasoning, the Pope is out of touch, is a recurrent theme with other moral questions. 
so that um, we see uh, some of the pro-family organizations in our own country today are called hate groups. There are official, you know, or, or, you know, some groups that if you are in favor of family as mother, father, and children and the extended family with it, then that is hate speech. This, I, I'm not making that up. Look it up on the internet and see how they, you know, a guy went into one of the pro-family groups in Washington and tried to assassinate the people because he was told it was a hate, hate group. It becomes very dangerous kind of speech. And um, this is something that we see uh, sometimes comedians. Comedians are a good example of this. Because what they will do is say, look, I'm just being honest, talking about my experience. If you want to talk about your own experience, instead of telling everybody about it in such a way that you say that this experience is OK for everybody to do, you want to talk about it? Come see me. I don't tell anybody about it. It's called confession. And it means you're sorry for your sin. But then you see others say, oh, no, no, no. People will feel guilt. One of the last sins in the world today is to have somebody feel guilty about sins. We don't want people feeling guilty, do we? No, I don't want them feeling guilty. But if they're guilty, come to confession. I don't want you just feeling guilty. Admit real guilt and come confess the sin and deal with it and correct it. But all those will say, no, 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 we're going to push the envelope. They, you know, they always say that. And they're, they're going to push the envelope, and we're going to talk about things, we're going to portray sin and glamorize it. And then we're also going to talk out of both sides of our mouths because we are going to be against uh, you know, any kind of censorship so that if we do violent movies, nobody can stop us. But we are also in favor of gun control. Unless they're fake guns in our movies where we show people getting blood and guts all over the place, that's OK. And I can make billions of dollars in some of these studio companies showing violent movies of vile types and destruction and all this stuff. But gun control, you know, we can't let the people have gun control. Remember, by the way, you know, gun control was something used in the 1880s and later in the South against African Americans. So that by the time the Jim Crow laws came up, they were able to, um, you know, have, they weren't able to have any guns to defend themselves. And the lynchings took place because there was no self-defense. So this is something that you have to say, watch some of the sophistry and the partial truths and inconsistencies and promotion of sin. These are what we call the false prophets who try to make sin look good, and themselves too, and make themselves rich, and then lead us into devastating sin. All right, we have to take a little break. Again, we want you to make sure that if you have any calls or any, any questions that you can call in, um, we have to make sure the email is scriptureandtradition at ewtn.com. Or you can also go to facebook.com slash EWTN online. You can also go to youtube.com slash EWTN. Or you can phone us. Our 800 number here inside North America is 1-800-221-9460. Or outside North America, it is country code 1, area code 205-271-2980. All right, we'll be back in just a couple of minutes with a little bit more on the role of, of Satan and then and his deceptions. And then we'll also uh, uh, deal with some of your questions and questions of our studio audience. So please stay with us.
right, let's continue on with this. And I uh, just want to mention a couple things here. I've gone through some of the problems that false apostles can deal with for us. Uh, and not only, they're not only religious groups, but there's also very secular people as well, who are apostles of relativism and secularism. All right, that's, that's very possible. Our task as Christians is, first of all, always be alert to the temptations. Don't become naive. This isn't my statement. It's what our Lord Jesus Christ had said a number of times throughout the gospel, especially in chapter 10 and in chapter uh, 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 Matthew's gospel and chapter 24, Mark 13, and other places where he warns us, stay awake, always watch, be alert. Gregoron, he, that's where Gregory comes from. You know, that's the word that he uses, uh, be alert. But then to be alert, what is the antidote? I mentioned this last week, but the antidote is you have to know the true faith well. And that means as you mature through life, keep learning more about the faith. You don't get all of it in your catechism class at grammar school, high school, college, or any of those stages, you keep learning more because your knowledge of our faith and our morals needs to keep up with the advance of knowledge in your whole life. You keep learning more as you get older. That's part of life. As you know, I'm getting, uh, I always used to say that I'm going to stay middle-aged till I'm 70, at which point, I'm, uh, I'll uh, renegotiate. Well, I'm getting ready for the renegotiation period <laughs> as I get to my last year of my 60s. But in, your, in my late 60s, I'm still learning more, and I have my faith to keep up, to integrate it. You never stop learning the faith. And as you learn the truth of our Catholic faith by knowing Scripture and the Catechism at the outset, but then keep on learning from the saints so that you study the writings by the saints. This is what I call the, the meat of our faith is sacred scripture. The potatoes of our faith are going to be the uh, writings by saints. Read St. Saint Augustine. Read St. Thomas Aquinas. Read the other great teachers of our faith. We have the series on the doctors of the church. Those doctors' writings are in our, uh, our computers. You can get it from the internet for free. Read it. Know it. And then the lives of the saints. Read that and their spirituality. That's the vegetables of our faith. That's your solid diet. For, for your spiritual life. And then, and only then, do you have a standard by which you can judge what people say to you. You can see through the falsehoods only if you know what is true. If you're still guessing, you will be subject to being tricked by all kinds of people. That's what we have to do. Now, I just want to go on to one last area St. Paul wrote about. He wrote two letters to his disciple, St. Timothy. And he left Timothy as the bishop of Ephesus in Asia Minor. And in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 24 and following, he writes, The Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but kindly to everyone, an apt teacher, patient, correcting opponents with gentleness. God may perhaps grant that they will repent and come to know the truth and that they may escape from the snare of the devil, having been held captive by him to do his will. That is our goal in teaching. When you learn the faith, 
It is not so that you can show, I'm right and you're wrong, so there. No, that's second grade. We want to be able to correct people of the false teaching they may hold that holds them captive to sin. And we, we uh, have to remember, as our Lord Jesus had taught in John chapter 8, verse 34, Everyone, I say, truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not continue in the house forever, the son does. So if the son makes you free, you will be free indeed. But if you commit sin and you know, give yourself over to sin, you make sin your master and you are a slave. If you don't believe me, ask a drug addict or an alcoholic, or a sex addict, or a pornography addict, how easy it is to give it up. They feel themselves as slaves to this. And then we also can be helped to remind people what our Lord taught in the same chapter of John's Gospel, chapter 8, verse 44, where Jesus said to us that Satan is a liar, and the father of lies. We have to be alert to that so that we don't fall into his snare. That's what he uses. Lies that include some truth, but in a falsehood to trick you into doing something that is sinful and therefore enslaving, because that's also the way Satan is. He is one who wants to enslave us. Look at communism. Look at National Socialism, the Nazis. Look at that. They enslaved people to work for the system. No, this is not what we want. Instead, St. Paul urges Timothy to be kindly and forbearing and gentle and to be someone who knows how to teach. An apt teacher is actually just one word. Um, the word is the didacticon. You know, good at teaching. Why are you good at teaching? Because you know your material and you know how to explain it. That's what he means. And this is not only for Timothy and all the bishops who have a primary job at that, but all of us need to know the truths of our faith, how to put it into words. I was over in Arlington, Texas, and I said what we have to do is learn how to speak Catholicism, not merely recognize it when we see it, but learn how to put our Catholic faith into words. That's how, that's how we can be gentle. When we don't know enough, then we just become argumentative. Because I said so! You know, the less we know, the more mean we get but, and angry. The more we know, the more gentle we can be and understand the people we're talking to, but see as our goal not to overpower them, but to help them know the faith. This is our task. All right, now that sort of concludes uh, this uh, chapter seven. We'll be starting chapter, uh, uh, excuse me, that, I think that's chapter eight. We'll be starting chapter nine on the Gospels next week. Uh, then after that, we're going to get going with our next book. When we finish this book, I'm going to, I've been talking about how to win the battle against sin. So the next Bible study we'll do after that will be on my book called Saved. Saved. You know, how do you, what does salvation mean? You know, so it's not enough to talk about sin, we'll talk about salvation too. All right, but let's take some questions. We have a question from our studio audience. Sir, where are you from? Hello, Father. My name is Dave. I'm from Northeast Texas, a little town Wait. called Lindale. Uh, yeah, I, I know it well. My question is, how does Satan influence us? Well, me personally, basically. Is, does he get into my thoughts? How does, how does that work? First of all, I don't want to have anybody think that Satan is a one-trick pony. He's not. There are a variety of ways that he can work with us. Sometimes... It'll be through, uh, you know, giving us thoughts that are distorted and false. 
And so, you know, oftentimes thoughts. And a lot of times, do not a lot of sins begin with a thought? You know, the, um, a good example that would be, take a look at Shakespeare. In Shakespeare's plays, uh, uh, Oth Othello would be a good example. How Othello is moved towards m killing his beloved wife because Iago puts bad thoughts into his mind that she might not be trustworthy and maybe she's cheating and all that kind of thing. That's one way. And Iago is a, a classic example of a, a force of evil. And then uh, there, there, sometimes it's not just my thoughts, it's in the public domain. Think about how somebody like the National Socialists were able to take Hitler's book as, you know, Mein Kampf, as their new Bible, replacement for the Bible, and begin teaching relativism. There is no such thing as absolute truth. Moral is, all moral morality is ab relative. And then, once you accept that, you can then start to say that certain people are inferior and less than human. And if they're less than human, can't you kill them? Isn't, and isn't that how we started with, again, it's a thought, but it's not a thought in your own mind. It's a thought that somebody like Hitler embeds in his National Socialism, and anybody who disagreed with him, he would send his brown shirts to go beat them up. So then he made people afraid. And then you see the enslavement begin. The communists did the same thing in, in Russia. After the October Revolution, when the October Revolution took place, it was 45,000 communists in the whole country. But they were so intimidating just killing enemies, just slaughtering people, everybody became terrified of them. And didn't Al-Qaeda, uh, well, uh, uh, Daesh, um, uh, what do they call it? ISIS, ISIS in English. Um, uh, ISIS did the same thing in Iraq. They went in, there were just a few hundred guys in pickup trucks. And they just slaughtered people. And everybody was scared, and the Iraqi army ran from them out of terror. And then they kept slaughtering more and just causing more terror. You see how the murder and terror works with fear. And then their evil ideas about Islam. And they, they took evil notions of Islam and were killing Muslims and Christians and others. This is a, they're all Nazis, terrorists, communists, all of them hate God or at least the, the notion of God that we would have in the case of ISIS. And they don't love God. I, I wouldn't say that ISIS displayed love of God, would you? They, they displayed fear of God and a terror in his name. But love? No. I wouldn't see that. All right, let's take, uh, oh, I got to take a break. We'll be back in a couple of minutes. We wanna, we're going to get some more emails and more questions from our studio audience. So please stay with us. Let's now go over to a phone call. We have <coughs> Maria on the line. Maria, where are you calling from? From Michigan, Detroit. Great. And I love your show, and I love you. All what you have in EWTN, it's wonderful. But I see churches are closing here in Michigan and everywhere, but here in Detroit. And I see why they're closing. There, there are people who want to open prayer groups, adoration, 
more than one a day or once a day. And, and what I see, holy people, military who wants to support the church, they're getting pushed away by libros because we have a lot of libros on our churches these days. Mm-hmm. And nothing we can do. I don't know what to do. I just, I go and every church is different rules, different. And when you stop talking, they just put their hands up and said, we don't want to hear about this. Yep. This is not true. This is not that. And you, I don't leave churches. I go to churches because where they need more to pray, I go. But it's ridiculous. Well, and what it, you could say about that. Yeah, a couple things. You know, uh, that's why I mentioned earlier on that, of course, we have some groups like Jehovah Witnesses and that go door to door trying to take us away from the true Christ of the gospel to a false Christ. And there are lots of different groups uh, of all kinds who present us with a Christ different than that of the, the gospels. But then, as I mentioned earlier today, even inside the churches, there will be some people who try to sway people away from the Orthodox Catholic faith. They will call it out of date, um, or politically incorrect, and all kinds of things as a way to undercut without giving any reason to explain what makes it out of date exactly. Just because, uh, I'll give an example. Well, today, I mean, uh, people just live together before marriage and you just got to catch up with the times. That's what they'll say. But that, just because it's common today, doesn't mean that therefore it is morally acceptable. You haven't given me a reason, except a lot more people are committing that sin. And you're also sometimes nervous that if we call it a sin, you'll turn them off. Well, um, I don't know that there is another word for it. Uh, It's something that is, and a good, some of the things that we need to also do is go more deeply into the truth of what's going on, namely that people who live together before marriage have a much higher divorce rate than people who waited until marriage. They say, well, that doesn't sound like the wisdom that y'all are given. Now, does it? And you, you also then go on to say, well, why would that be? Why would that happen? You have to ask that question. And one of the reasons is when you talk to people who do wait and have a chaste courtship followed by a happy marriage, is that during that chaste courtship, of course they're tempted, that's human, but they also learn that in that waiting, they could trust each other to wait. You don't have, but oh, but honey, I've got to. You don't understand what it's like. I've gotten. Well, what people learn in marriage is that you can't always be intimate at every stage of life, every moment of marriage. And there are lots of times where you have to refrain because of sickness, sometimes pregnancy, post birth. Uh, business travel, military travel and separation, all kinds of reasons for separation. But during the courtship, if you learn, I can wait and I can trust you and you can trust me to remain faithful while we wait. Then after marriage, I also know I can trust you. And you have no other time in which to learn that trust like the engagement. And then you say, aha, not only is it something that the church is trying to prevent you from sinning by doing, but there is wisdom in the church's teaching. But you have to poke around to find real wisdom. 
and understanding. And so that's one of the things that we try to do. And this is, these are just some examples. The same thing with messing around with the liturgy and all the stuff. You end up, if you treat the, the, the church's teaching as your plaything, you do drive people away because people want faith. They want faith in Jesus Christ. They want the Savior and not watered down stuff. And so if you want the truth and committed people, commit yourself to the teachings of Christ. Proclaim it and be faithful to it. And as far as what you do when you're you know, in a situation, if that's the only parish you can get to, you can't go to a place that where they are a little bit more Catholic, then every time you go to church, come early. 15, 20 minutes early, and pray for the people. Pray first for the priest, for the servers, the readers, the choir. And then I always like to look around church for someone who looks miserable. They're there. They show up. Sometimes their parents make them, or their wife or husband makes them. Look around for the miserable-looking one and pray for that one. Just pray for that one. Don't, don't go take all of them on. If you have some friends, split up the miserable people among you and pray for them. But find them and pray for them. Watch and see. It'll transform your parish. We have a question from our studio. Sir, where are you from? I'm from Goa. Goa, India? Okay. Goa. All right, it's great. St. Francis Xavier. Yeah, that's right. That's okay. where he is buried. Yeah. I, At the I great like cathedral there. So your question? My question about that marriage, you must try to correct inside the church with bishops and send to Benedict XVI, the greatest, greatest theologian yeah. we had. Yeah. And, and about the, what? What, what, yeah. what are you talking about? About the sex, same-sex marriage. Yes. We can't use in... And Benedict XVI mm -hmm. obliged church to recite the Nicene Creed in the Diocese of Worcester, they was reciting Apostolic Creed. Right. Yeah. And it, the Diocese of Worcester is a mess. Yeah. You, well, you have seen, on Sunday, the bishop celebrate Mass, October. Yeah. You, are, you have been there. And he couldn't pronounce one small sentence in Latin. Well, I'm not going to go after yeah. <coughs> the, the diction of any of the specific yeah. bishops. But what you were saying before, in general, about things like same-sex marriage and other things, uh, or calling um, um, uh, pro-choice rather than pro-abortion, these are ways in which people try to win the culture war by getting hold of the language and controlling the discussion. And so that's why uh, we uh, have to learn to be smarter than that and use correct terminology that's descriptive so that we can address the issues. Let me get an email here. It says, um, this is from uh, Peggy. Your Father Packwood, Jesus says, if anyone bl uh, blasphemes against him, he will be forgiven. But if he blasphemes against the Holy Spirit, that sin will not be forgiven. Please speak to this. Well, keep in mind, when did Jesus our Lord say that? It was right after he did an exorcism, cast the demon out, and then the people attributed the exorcism to Satan. In other words, they were calling something that was good, and they were saying that it is something evil from Satan. So in that case, they be made themselves incapable of even seeing what is good. How can they possibly ever change if they call good evil? And this is what, that's what he's talking about there. And this is something that um, he, that's what he means. Plus, he, uh, there's some, another category that St. Uh, John Paul II mentions and light of the teaching of St. Thomas Aquinas, that some people commit the sin against the Holy Spirit by saying, I'm so bad, God cannot forgive me. Cannot forgive me. And so then they make themselves incapable of getting forgiven because I can't be forgiven. 
So that's, that's another way of committing the sin against the Holy Spirit. It's an interior blocking of God's goodness in your life. I have another question for our studio audience. Ma'am, uh, where are you from? Merritt Island, Florida. Great. And your question? My question is that I have noticed that there are several books on exorcism that have come out recently, many from a Catholic press. Mm -hmm. uh, are there any in particular that you would recommend? Yeah, I, I would go with uh, reading the books by Father Amorth, A-M-O-R-T-H. Father Amorth is quite good, uh, and I think pretty much we have, we allow him, uh, uh, we have him in our uh, uh, catalog in our bookstore here so uh, that he's, he's a fine he, he was an exorcist in Rome and taught many other exorcists he's, he's a great resource okay. all right then we have another one here father Mitch why is the Bible so filled with killing and God telling the Jews to wipe out so many people so viciously why should we read this kind of thing Lorraine in Florida first of all <coughs> Lorraine we read the Bible apparently I think you need to because it's not full of that. There are a few instances of it. Now, that doesn't mean I'm commending it. Don't get me wrong. Uh, you know, don't jump to a conclusion. But there aren't that many cases of it. There are very few, in fact, of, uh, you know, uh, uh, Jericho is one of the few. And even there, the one family that was righteous was saved. And there are, it's a, uh, it's a, somewhat complicated thing, but you also have to keep in mind, in the ancient world, this is tribal warfare. And if you want to understand tribal warfare, I recommend you take a look at the movie, rent the movie, uh, Lawrence of Arabia, when he is trying to unite the Arab tribes, and you see the fighting amongst them, and the mentality then you can get an insight into the ancient tribes of Israel. What you see is that this happened uh, at Jericho, partially happened at Ai, and a couple other places. But then the longer they got to know the Lord, the less killing they did. And they really improved over time. Now, I'm working on a book on that topic, in fact, because it's, it's an important one. And we'll get to it in, in some future show, shows in great detail. But that's a start. And take a look carefully at what goes on there. Also, they're punishing the Canaanites for the sins they had of killing their own children by burning them alive as sacrifices to gods. That was the big sin they were committing. But one sin I can't commit is go over time. So we are flat out. So may the Lord bless you and keep you and cause his face to shine upon you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And again, Amen. we ask you to keep us in between your gas bill, electric bill, and cable bill. Because especially in the summertime when people are traveling, they sometimes forget, and we st but our bill collectors don't. So please, please remember us. Thank you. Amen.